In this podcast, we share experiences and expertise to help navigate through the world of breast cancer. If this is your first time here, welcome. I am so glad you are here. And if you are a regular listener, then welcome back, my friend. I hope you have been well and you are staying safe. This is a rather different episode than any of my previous episodes, because in this episode, I have collected the best bits from all the guests who have appeared on the show so far and merged them all into this one episode just for your listening pleasure. As this is the last episode before the summer break, I thought, why not look back and enjoy the wisdom, expertise and the amazingly inspirational stories we have had the privilege to listen to so far. You may have missed a few previous episodes, and if you have, then this may spur you on to go back and get listening. On the other hand, if you have been a faithful listener, and I thank you for that so very much, then this is a great opportunity to catch up and listen to old friends. So, to begin with, I'm starting with Sarah Lianagay, who was on episode 5. Sarah found a lump in her armpit whilst on holiday, she got this checked out and here she describes what happened next. Obviously, I thought the fact that they were doing a biopsy made me think it's not just a cyst. It's not the same thing that I've got in my breasts, which is what I was thinking it probably was. I'm not a medically trained person. I don't know anything about this sort of thing. So I was going into this as a complete novice, not understanding the link between lumps in the armpit and um and breast cancer so I you know at that time I didn't know enough I didn't know anything that I know now and I think also part of it was also wishful thinking on my part as well so you know I didn't want to worry about it they hadn't said to me oh it's really worrying this this lump in your armpit it was more a case of what well, it's a bit unusual but we're not really sure so we'll just do a little test. So they then gave you the diagnosis of breast cancer and yet they haven't really found any abnormalities in your breast. So I understand that they, did they do more tests to find out if they had missed it on the mammogram? Yes. So they didn't give me a diagnosis of breast cancer at that stage. They said your lymph nodes are swollen with cancer cells. So that's how I had my cancer diagnosis. It wasn't you've got breast cancer, it was, we did the test on your lymph nodes and it's come back positive for cancer cells. So that obviously that was an absolute shock to me. That was not expected and it completely floored me. I was absolutely, totally blown away with shock. Then he proceeded to explain that it was a bit of a dilemma for them because the lymph nodes had come back testing positive for cancer cells, but they couldn't find a tumour in my breasts from the mammogram or the ultrasound that they'd done at my previous appointment. And they'd revisited those in light of the test results for the armpit lump. And it was a little bit confusing. And I was really confused because I was in shock and I was thinking, well, where where have these cancer cells come from? So the consultant sent me off for um, a breast MRI. So I went, not that day, but went along for my breast MRI appointment, which is more sensitive to picking up changes in breast than the mammogram. Yes, yeah, so it'll pick up things that mammogram would not necessarily pick up. It's highly, highly sensitive. Yeah, which I didn't realise at the time either, and I do now. So I went off my MRI, went back for the test results, and the MRI hadn't picked up anything. And so we were really, you know, I was really confused by this shock, still in a state of shock, and, and you know, confusion was getting more and more intense by the day. So following the MRI, it was a question of, right, the cancer cells have to have come from somewhere. So we'll send you for a PET scan. So the hunt continues. The hunt continued. And again, I, I had entered a new world. I didn't know anything about the medical side of things. 
never had anyone in my family go through this. So, you know, all these different scans were all new to me. I'd never heard of a PET scan. I found out that it was the the most sensitive of scans and they were going to test me from head to toe to see if there was a sign of anything anywhere in my body. And I had shadows on my pancreas and my thyroid. I got those scanned subsequently. I had another MRI um, ultrasound. They came back just as, as nothing. They were just shadows. But I think because of the sensitivity of the pet, it can be things that actually turn out not to be anything. And and really, that was sort of the last port of call, really, in terms of scanning me. I don't know how they how they do this. You'll know this better than me, Tasha. But they were able to test the cells that were in my lymph nodes in my armpit. I don't know how they do this, but somehow or other, they know that the cancer cells in the lymph nodes were breast cancer cells, HER2 positive, and they were estrogen positive. So they were absolutely 100% confident that I had breast cancer, but they just weren't sure where it had come from. And so at that point, I was told, we're treating this as breast cancer. It's an unusual situation. And in fact, my breast consultant who, he's retired now, and I imagine he was 70 odd when he was treating me. He was certainly incredibly experienced. And he said to me, he'd only seen this situation half a dozen times in his career. So he'd come across it before, which was comforting, but really not very often. So I think for me, everyone's the same, you know, we all being diagnosed with cancer is incredibly scary for everybody. I had this sort of added confusion element to mine. So for a couple of weeks, I was in limbo of, I've got cancer, but I'm not entirely sure what it is. Once I got that sort of final diagnosis of, right, we're treating it as breast cancer, and now we're going to talk about the treatment plan. It was actually a point where I could then accept what was happening. Yes, it was scary. I was in shock. And I was petrified. But knowing that then we could put a treatment plan into place was quite comforting in a peculiar way. So Sarah continued to have surgery, followed by chemotherapy, radiotherapy and endocrine treatment. Her story of how she was diagnosed was rather unusual and highlighted the importance of not forgetting the armpits or axilla when we examine our breasts. Now, as we know, breast cancer does not discriminate and it can affect women and men, young and old. Helen Deverell was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 29 In episode 10, I asked her how the breast cancer diagnosis impacted her and explored the issue of fertility in breast cancer treatment. First of all, it was uh, just complete shock and um, and surreal. And then as a 29-year-old woman about to turn 30, I'd been married for a couple of years. My first thoughts went to, can I have children? That was next on our agenda. That was part of my plan. And and I was then told that it would, I, I probably could have children, but I would have to wait at least five years before I could even think about that. And while that wasn't a complete no, that I actually found, and I've heard other women say the same, that that actually was the harder bit. Being told mm. I had cancer was one thing, but then to be told I may or may not be able to have children and, and that couldn't be guaranteed and the treatment may or may not affect my fertility, that was quite devastating. And I think at that particular age, when everyone around you is suddenly having children and you're stuck not knowing what that future holds, that um, that can really affect you and, and your mental health. Um, and I think that's the bit that isn't focused on as much because all the focus is on obviously getting you better, um, which obviously I'm very appreciative of. Um, but yes. the, that the other side of it is almost um, sidelined a little bit because it's not seen as the more urgent part and I suppose the other thing as well was from a work perspective I was off work for seven months I was at a point in my career where I felt like I was starting to progress and do well and and suddenly you have to step out and and as much as I suppose we all know we can't really plan life I think you like to think you can and I suddenly everything I'd had planned and was just out the window and I was suddenly facing a very different future which is true as you said whatever age you're diagnosed but I think as a young woman the that it is 
particularly difficult with the the fertility aspect and and just so disruptive at that particular age that you're at yeah. and it was the age where by the time I would be sort of 35 now that's the age when you're sort of starting to think well I really need to get on the fertility thing because you're told as you get past 35 your fertility um, starts to decline so yes. suddenly I'm in a position where well I've got to wait five years but when I get there I don't know where I'm going to be in fertility wise so it suddenly yeah. becomes a bit gray and that's a uh, as, as, as bizarre as it may sound that was the more terrifying bit than the actual cancer you're absolutely right I think fertility is something that we don't talk about as much because we get a cancer diagnosis and the overall or the overarching mission is to treat that cancer. But at the same time, if somebody who has been diagnosed with breast cancer is of a childbearing age and is still wanting to have children, if they, you know, they might have had children but wanting more, or if they haven't started their family and are thinking of having children, fertility is something that needs to be addressed. So when you were going through the treatment diagnosis and treatment was the fertility issue discussed um it was discussed and you know and i i'm i still see my consultants and i'm i'm very grateful to them for everything they did um but i think their view at the time was that because i didn't freeze any eggs and they uh my oncologist particularly was quite against that he felt because i had an estrogen receptive tumor that that wouldn't be advisable yeah. and i think he felt that because the chemotherapy i was having was a quite a mild one and that i was going to have zolodex which basically uh, would put my ovaries to sleep and protect them and factoring in my younger age he felt that my body would be protected and recover enough to have children later on so that was discussed and that was agreed but i think what i didn't realize at the time what, what maybe they didn't realize was actually after that it got quite difficult because I suddenly realized that I didn't have any insurance. So I had to wait five years, but what was to say I wouldn't get another tumor in five years and then that or in that five years and that could push me back again and suddenly I'm going to be 37, 38 before I can try it or I might be 40. That played in my mind a lot that I didn't have anything frozen to to fall back on. And I, I literally had to wait with that time before I could even think about anything. And I think that was the bit that I struggled with was not having what I called my my insurance, that they, they would be there. Um, waiting for me so I found that that quite difficult and I, I think maybe looking back I felt that maybe I should have pushed a bit harder to have that but then I'm sure they they had their reasons for why they felt that that wasn't appropriate at the time but obviously sure. I didn't have other women that did have them frozen but it it's difficult to know what what the right thing to do is and I think that that is part of the problem is you know you're going into it you're not an expert and far from it and suddenly you're facing this whole new world and you have to make these decisions quite quickly and you don't know, realize necessarily what impact they'll have on you after. And I personally found it very difficult. And I suppose just to qualify what I said before as well about the it almost being more devastating than the cancer. Obviously, I was in a very privileged position of having been diagnosed early. So I had been told chances are you're going to be OK. So maybe I would have felt differently had my prognosis not been as good or I'd been diagnosed at a later stage. Um, sure. so I don't mean to be dismissive of, of other people in that way, but I think because of when I was diagnosed and there was a talk of a very hopeful future, um, I think then my focus very much went to the fertility aspect. And I felt that that was something that, with hindsight, I wish we'd had maybe more discussion about so that I could have really understood more, I think, to really understand the rationale behind that decision. Helen subsequently told me that she was expecting her first child, so that was amazing news. But this episode highlighted the importance of discussing fertility. And if you are of a childbearing age, whether you've had children or you are still thinking about it, then please do make a point to discuss this issue with your team. Now, there are many types of breast cancer. And in this conversation with a pathologist on episode three, yeah, it was one of the first episodes. Dr. Peter Davis explains the differences between invasive and in situ, as well as ductal and lobular carcinoma. It was an absolutely fascinating conversation. And if you want to learn more about breast cancer at a more cellular level, then I definitely encourage you to listen to the whole of the episode. The main groups um, in the traditional sort of anatomical way of looking at this is that there are ductal carcinomas mm -hmm. and those are tumors which are derived from the duct so if we we go from having a normal duct growing normally as it should be to too much proliferation within the duct 
to uncontrolled proliferation within the duct. And if that gets to the point where that's growing a tumour, it becomes a ductal carcinoma. Now, ductal carcinoma is a good way of looking at um, the other thing that people might have heard of is, is in situ. So ductal carcinoma in situ means a malignant proliferation within the duct, but it hasn't yet got the ability to break out of the duct because the error in its genetics that grows from a mutation that allows it to do that hasn't happened yet. So, so it's confined within the duct. growth becomes confined within a duct. Okay, so that's a ductal carcinoma, that's a ductal carcinoma in situ. DCIS, really. DCIS. Now okay. that's in situ in that it's not broken out into the surrounding breast, but what it does tend to do is creep along the tube. Right, along the ducts. Along the ducts. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the characteristics of DCIS. Um, it tends to be associated with calcification, often. Not always, that's the problem. Um, okay. So that can be one of the ways that you guys follow it. Once a ductal carcinoma has moved beyond that, um, it can develop the ability to invade. Right. That is where a cancer is known to be an invasive cancer. That's right. Or an invasive ductal carcinoma. That's right. Okay. Um, so you can tell whether a cancer is an invasive cancer by virtue of it going through the ducts. That's right. Beyond the ducts or the that's confines right. of the ducts. Exactly. Into the breaking out into that surrounding fatty tissue. Now, lobular carcinoma is a pretty similar process, but it grows it's thought, from cells within the lobules. So these two tumours, when they're at a relatively early stage, they look quite distinctive. And for a long time, they look distinctive. And the way we tell one from the other is by looking for what they seem to be trying to do, looking at what they look like they've come from. So an invasive tumour that looks like it's forming tubes... Is a ductal. Is probably a ductal carcinoma. Right. Whereas an invasive lobular carcinoma, a tumour a tumor that's made of lots of little cells that look like the ones you see in a lobule, is probably a lobular carcinoma. Okay. The problem comes when tumours get more advanced and more aggressive, they can start to look worse and worse down the microscope to the point where it becomes really difficult to work out... Distinguish between the two. Just by eyeball to okay. distinguish between the two. So then what do you do to distinguish between the two? You do other stains? We do other stains. I mean, we have, um, when we talk about stains, what we're talking about is the, uh, first of all, the H&E stain, which okay. shows us morphology. Um, but we have certain things that we can do where we use uh, what we call immunohistochemistry. Or, or IHC. Immuno, or IHC, all abbreviations for the same thing. And what we're doing there is we're using, in essence, an antibody, which um, has a, an ink on it or an enzyme on it that activates an ink. Now that antibody, people might think of antibodies as something you see in infection, and you might have an antibody to nuts, yeah. which is why you have a nut allergy. allergy right? yeah? Yeah. So we're borrowing that reaction, and we're saying, we want to know if this unidentified cell that might be ductal, that might be lobular, has a particular protein on it that's too small to see with our eyes, even with a microscope, but we want to know if it's there, because if it's there, it's more likely to be lobular. So we try an antibody on it and we'll try a range of antibodies on it. And the antibody that picks up that particular protein will activate an enzyme which lights up an ink. Right, and so then suddenly you can tell. that cell changes colour. So we look for the cells that have changed colour and we say if a certain proportion of them have changed colour, they're positive for that particular protein, yeah? Yep. And that allows us to say more likely than not, these particular cells that we're looking at have probably come from a lobule rather than a duct. Breast cancer is the commonest cancer that affects women in the UK. The majority of breast cancers, however, occur sporadically. In other words, it is not inherited or run in the family. In fact, only 5 to 10% of breast cancers are genetically linked. I had a conversation with Dr. Munaza Ahmed in episode 11, as well as Sarah Robart in episode 13, both of whom are experts in the field of breast cancer genetics. Firstly, I asked Muna about the commonest genetic mutations we see in breast cancer, which is BRCA1 and 2. And then I asked Sarah her opinion about the direct-to-consumer genetic kits that is kind of widely available now. What is the lifetime cancer risk conferred by a BRCA gene mutation compared to the population risk? The population risk of developing breast cancer is around 12%, uh, 1 in 8. But if you carry a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, 
that risk has been estimated to be up to 80%. But the there's a range of risk because of the things I've just talked about. The BRCA mutation isn't the single factor that determines what's its very important factor in determining whether you'll develop breast or ovarian cancer. It's not the single factor. So there is a range in risk. So whilst we say the risk can be up to 80%, we know that if we look at individual families, in some families that risk is going to be lower, say 60% or 45%. However, that risk is still several fold higher than the population risk of developing breast cancer. So for, for BRCA1, the risk of breast cancer is within a range of 60 to 80%, although it could be lower. For BRCA1, I'd say it is 60 to 80%. For BRCA2, more re- so originally we'd said we'd always quoted 80% as the risk, but more recent research has indicated that perhaps the risk for BRCA2 mutation carriers is more likely to be in the range of 45 to 60%. Um, but, you know, regardless, that's still a much higher risk than the population risk. And particularly for BRCA1, the risk is higher at younger ages. So whilst I quoted that the population risk is at 12%, the vast majority of those breast cancers will happen above the age of 50 after the menopause. Whereas for BRCA1 mutation carriers, the risk of developing breast cancer compared to other women in the general population is much higher when they're in their 30s or 40s. That's not to say that if you carry a BRCA1 mutation, you can't develop breast cancer after the age of 50. You certainly can. But much of that increased lifetime risk of developing breast cancer is actually conferred at those younger ages of for women when they're in their 30s or 40s. With BRCA2, We tend to see a later age of onset, but there is still an increased risk compared to general population when women are in their 30s and 40s. But much of the cancer risk is still conferred after the age of 50. There's um, lots of commercial kits out there that you can get your, I don't know, you get your genes tested for various things. What are your thoughts on that? Um, it's it's something I feel pretty strongly about um, at working as as a genetic counselor. Um, the testing that is done in these kind of home genetic testing kits is very limited, and it's not doing a full proper check like you would get with a clinical test. There's you know I'm not going to name drop the the name of the company, but there's a very popular at-home genetic testing kit where you spit in the tube and and ship it off. And that, for example, it checks three common uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene alterations that we see commonly in people of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. So for a person who has no Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, this is essentially a meaningless test. Um, it's, It's almost certainly going to come back with a normal result. And it wouldn't be checking for the thousands of other gene alterations that we know can occur in those genes. So it's um, it's always a little bit uh, soul crushing for me when I hear about a woman who has had one of these tests and has been reassured by it or falsely reassured by it because they weren't looking for the correct gene alteration, either the gene alteration that's known to be in her family or they weren't doing a proper test by looking at all of the genes in detail. And kind of the interpretation and the support to digest that result and to give them kind of meaningful context for it isn't there if you've just spat into a tube and you get the results on your computer screen. It's, you know, genetics is quite complicated and that's why people like me have jobs to help people understand their genetic risk and and to give them an appropriate test if it's appropriate. Okay, so these DIY genetic testing kits is something you would not advise people to to do. No, it's not something I ever really recommend for people to do. Um, if if they, uh, you know, things like ancestry and and ethnic background, you know, that's kind of fun and recreational genetics. Um, but for generally speaking, these these at home kits when they're checking things for health and 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 medical risk is not something that's that's usual. Now. Surgical treatment of breast cancer, broadly speaking, either involves breast conservation surgery or a lumpectomy or a mastectomy with or without reconstruction. 
In episode 15, I had a conversation with Juliet Fitzpatrick, who was recommended to have a mastectomy and a delayed reconstruction. Here she describes her decision-making process and why she decided against having a reconstruction and to go flat. Well, I thought I started to think it all through, actually. I went home um, and started feeling a little bit uh, uncertain about whether I wanted to go through with the reconstruction. I did go to see a plastic surgeon who kind of talked me through how it would work, but I was feeling really unsure about having it. Right. And I knew that I didn't have to have the, rec- I wouldn't have the reconstruction straight at the same time as the mastectomy. So I had some time, but I, I did start Googling and sort of say, you know, I looked for, you know, do, do, does every woman who has a mastectomy have reconstruction? And actually I found out that no, that doesn't happen. And so I started doing a bit more research and looking into it. And I start over time, over, over, over a few days, I suppose, I started thinking that actually I don't think I want to do that mm-hmm. at all. You know, even after I, even after a year or or whatever. So um, I, I, find, I actually found a really good Facebook group called Flat Friends, which um, helped me to, you know, I could interact with some of the women on there and help me to make my mind up and um, find out what it had been like to, for them to be flat. So I actually decided that I wouldn't have reconstruction at all. And before I had my mastectomy, I asked to go and see my surgeon again, and I wanted to ask him if he would do a bilateral mastectomy um because what i haven't mentioned is i i did have very large breasts i was a 34 double g okay. cup so it'd be quite lopsided if you had a mastectomy yeah. um just on one side that was that yeah. was the worry okay it was the worry yeah and obviously he said no yes uh well not obviously but he did say no um he said let's let's do the do the mastectomy to, and, and and get rid of the cancer and then let's you know we can maybe maybe talk about it uh, after that. So that's that's where we were, and and I had the mastectomy, and yeah, it was traumatic. <laughs> so you you essentially made up your mind that you didn't want to have a reconstruction before you had the mastectomy. You yeah, didn't need did. that time to to consider your options. No, I didn't. In the end, I felt quite strongly that I I didn't want to have. And uh, um, for me, what's uh, in the end seemed to be an unnecessary operation. Yeah. Um, and in fact, possibly more than one operation, you know, and possibly some some surgery on my other breast as well. I and and I think at the time that was what was driving my decision was I wanted to have as few procedures as possible. Yes, and that, that to be honest, that's not an unusual motivation. Lots of women who I who I um who I see. Oh, is that Stanley or is that That's that Stanley, Stanley again? again <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lots of women who I see, they do opt for the simplest of surgeries for many reasons, you know, to, to be able to get on with their lives, to not mm. to want to go back to hospital if they have any potential complications or wound healing problems and such like, which of course with reconstruction, there's always a possibility because yeah. the, the more complex an operation, the, the riskier it can be. So when you... You decided to have your mastectomy without reconstruction. Obviously, you needed the mastectomy, so you had that done. How did you feel when you woke up the next day and realized that you didn't have one one of your breasts? Yeah, for me, it was incredibly traumatic, actually. Um, Strangely so, because, as I said, I had very large breasts, and um, I didn't really like them that much because I'm quite a small person i'm about i'm five foot two so right. they always seem to be quite big for me but when i woke up yeah i was i was really upset uh, i just couldn't i found it very hard to come to terms with the loss of my breast um and i suppose it was i couldn't i don't didn't feel like i could look at it at my chest the first day certainly um but i did have to stay in hospital for two nights and so the second day i did look at it and I think the thought of what I was going to see was worse than actually what I did right. see. So, yeah, it, it was okay. And, you know, when I got home and I was in my own space, uh, I felt more comfortable at, you know, trying to come to terms with it. And... Juliet subsequently underwent a symmetrizing mastectomy on the other side and had a better experience second time round. She actually felt empowered with her decision and now advocates for those who choose to go flat. 
Juliet chose not to have reconstruction, but there are many women who do prefer to have a reconstruction. And with any cancer operation, the main aim and focus is always to remove the cancer safely, first and foremost. However, the aesthetic side of the surgery is also important. And there are various techniques that we can use in order to improve aesthetic outcomes of breast cancer surgery. And fat transfer or lipofilling is one such technique. In episode 17, I talked to Dr. Jacqueline Lewis, who is an oncoplastic surgeon, and here she described what the technique involves and what we use it for. Lipofilling or fat transfer, also known as lipomodeling, it involves harvesting free fat from, say, the abdomen, the thighs, the flanks. So liposuction of any extra fat and then washing the fat, removing the excess blood and oil, and then re-injecting those live fat cells into an area where it may be needed. So for breast surgery, it's possible to fill a wide local excision defect if you haven't been able to use the breast tissue or if there isn't very much breast tissue after a lumpectomy. You can use it for whole breast reconstruction. For example, the remaining fatty tissue underneath the skin over an implant type reconstruction is thin and you can see the edge of the implant or rippling. Having a bit of fat in between the skin and the implant will mask the implant, so it's very useful in that respect. Also, to touch up volume or contour defects after the use of a flap after recon- for reconstruction is very useful too. The major limiting thing is the amount of fat that can be harvested if someone is thin. And the other limitation is that you can only inject as much fat as you feel will be in contact with live tissue where you're going to inject it. So if you have very thin, say for example, you've done a reconstruction of a breast with an implant and you've got very thin skin over the surface of the implant and there's a lot of rippling. In order to be able to mask that implant, you're going to have to have enough fat. And so the more fat you have, the thicker the fatty layer, the more it will mask the implant. But when you first do the fat injections, you need to inject little, little bits. So we normally inject little packets of uh, fat or linguine type um, strands underneath the skin right sure that each of those fat globules is in contact with live tissue because in order for the fat to survive it will need to be in contact with live tissue to take up a blood supply so at each operation or each injection you can only inject a little bit and you need to normally do several injections um, with a minimum of 8 to 12 weeks in between each injection because a portion of the fat you inject will not survive and that will be um, taken up by the body and got, gotten rid of. If you make the mistake of injecting too much fat into an area, that fat will necrose or die and you'll get a fat cyst and eventually you could get calcifications because, you know, The reason why fat transfer got a bad reputation about 20 years ago is because surgeons were injecting too much fat into an area. Fat was dying and there'd be lumps and fat cysts, calcifications in the breast and the radiologists, um, the people who read mammograms, weren't so experienced in those days of um, being able to gauge between fat necrosis from fat transfer versus microcalcifications that can sometimes be associated with early breast cancer. Right. More experienced now, the radiologists are better able to make that distinction. In the UK, all those treated for breast cancer should have access to a breast care nurse. Amongst numerous roles they play, 
A breast scan nurse becomes an integral part of the person's treatment pathway. They are always available to answer questions and they are there to help provide support and help with the decision-making process. They're also able to signpost important and useful information so the, the whole process can be easier to digest and easier to understand. And most of all, they are always there for the patient. In episode nine, I talked to Sally Shanley, who is a breast care nurse. We explored how it is not uncommon for patients to suddenly feel lost and emotionally low once active treatment ends and what she can do or what she does to help people move forward. It's a very classic thing that we're, and I think we've identified it in more recent years. I mean, the Americans sort of call it survivorship. And I think what we tend to call it moving forward in this country, because I think it's looking forward. And there's the classic build up. And I think as professionals, we're as guilty of it as the patients in the build up. You know, it's going to be your last treatment next week. Mm. Um, I'm based on the chemotherapy unit. So I meet patients throughout their chemo and they build up and up and up to this big day when they're going to finish their chemo. They even ring a bell now. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Uh, I'm not sure about the bell ringing either. And so they, they ring this bell and that's it and mm. that's done and that's treated. And they're high as kites, they go home, they celebrate and it's all done and finished. And then we say, we'll see you in three months. Fab, haven't got to go back to the hospital for three months. And then two, three, four weeks into it, all of a sudden, wham, everything yeah. hits them. So what, what can we do to you know, support those to try to move forward, because this is something that mm. I think is extremely important. Mm. Um, I've heard uh, somebody mentioned the other day that they were not prepared for the emotional no, and absolutely. mental impact, you know, forget about the physical impact of surgery, yeah. but the mental and emotional impact of a breast cancer diagnosis was really not particularly discussed well they haven't had the time so if that treatment process has been on average sometimes it's up to a year they're busy they've got this appointment they've got that appointment if they're trying to look after the family if they're working in the middle of it as well and it's just surviving in that year and to me that's the survivorship part of it mm -hmm. is getting through that year is moving on from that year when all of a sudden the time is hanging. They they haven't got an appointment for three or four weeks or maybe three months. Who are they going to go to? Who are they going to call? Who are they going to speak to if something worries them? Do they save that worry up until they see somebody or is it okay to bother somebody? So do you help them in trying to move forward? I hope so. I think I think what we probably need to do more now is prepare patients for that moving forward time. And how do you do that? So what you don't want to be is too negative. So you don't want to make them think, oh, well, I'm not looking forward to that. That's going to be awful. But I think it is warning them a little that there will be a period of almost let down. An old phrase, I don't know whether it's a general phrase, an old phrase we've always had in our family is the morning after the Lord Mayor's show. Right. So the Lord Mayor's show is colourful, bright, exciting, your centre of attention. And then all of a sudden... Everybody else is going to carry on their normal lives. The kids have gone back to school. You have partners carrying on working. And then all of a sudden, there you are. And in a way, I think there's a lot now about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And you know, it's almost reminiscent. Some of the side effects that patients experience are a bit reminiscent of PTSD. And I've been supporting a friend who's had a diagnosis of PTSD from having been in intensive care on and off over many months. And she's experienced, and I'm recognising some of the things in her flashbacks, uh, lethargy, anxiety about going out, and in a funny way, actually not wanting those hospital appointments because they're afraid of what they might be told at them, but wanting them because they want to be reassured. You know, moving forward is so important. Mm. 
and how do you help them moving forward? I think information, advice. I meet with, I offer, I don't insist, you can't insist, I offer, for want of a better word, an appointment for to look at moving forward. So they have an hour to two hours, of, usually two hours, when we sit and we... Every single appointment with every patient in that process has been totally different. So some, it may be that their relationship's been affected, their work has been affected, they are concerned about maybe menopausal side effects and treatments, their body image has changed, their relationship with their kids. And I've tried to semi-script those appointments so that I'm ticking the boxes and discussing each thing, and I haven't been able to. As every patient has totally different needs. In March 2020, our lives and the world changed forever. The COVID-19 pandemic affected us all in so many ways and how we deliver healthcare was also radically affected. Hospitals had to reconfigure their service in order to look after those affected by the virus. Working staff were deployed, retired staff were called back to help, medical students and student nurses were drafted in early... And when the pandemic was at its peak, we all went into lockdown. In episode 14, I talked about how the pandemic affected my work as a surgeon. I described what it felt like to do remote clinic consultations amidst the lockdown. And I also talked about how the breast service still managed to continue to see those who needed our help, even when the situation was far from perfect. So I've just finished the uh, remote clinic consultation and that was actually pretty hard going. We had about seven patients on the list and the majority of them, six of them actually, I had to break bad news to. And that is never an easy task when it's face-to-face, let alone having to do it over the telephone. At the time of the clinic assessment, when it did look suspicious, we always do tell patients that it does, in fact, look worrying and that it may well be a cancer, but we won't really know for sure until we get the results. So we do forewarn patients if it looks like a possible cancer, but despite that, of course... Breaking bad news is never easy, and it's never easy to receive either. It's, it's, a really, it's a really weird environment we're working in at the moment because when you break bad news, you need that human connection. And at the moment, obviously, we can't give that because we can't, you know, we're not in the same room. We can't give that, I guess, human touch, um, if you will. And it just feels very remote and very clinical, which is quite a difficult and um, challenging thing to have to come to terms with. We still provide support. And so during the clinic consultation, the breast care nurse will then have a conversation with, with the patients over the telephone as well to provide support. And um, so we do do that. But yeah, it's not ideal and it's, it's far from perfect. But we are where we are. Um, hopefully, at some point, we will get out of this and be able to conduct clinic consultations in the normal way, which is face-to-face. But until such time, unfortunately, this is how we are having to do our clinic consultations um, at the moment. So earlier, I did a virtual clinic. That is a clinic that was done over the telephone. But of course, there are times when I still need to see people face to face. And despite the lockdown, despite the physical distancing, um, we as a breast cancer service still need to see people with breast symptoms. So the only time at the moment, apart from operating, of course, that we see people face to face is during a one stop breast clinic. And um, these are clinics where people who have breast symptoms come to see us and we assess them and do investigations if necessary. 
So that is the next clinical commitment that I will be taking you through. So, bye. Morning. Morning. Can we just walk through? Yeah, that's fine. Thanks. So I'm just walking to my clinic now. Got a one-stop breast clinic. The hospital remains quiet. And yeah, it's a very, very quiet morning today. Everybody seems to be quite upbeat, which is nice to see. Morning. Right, let's get into the clinic room. Right. So in the UK, if you have a breast symptom, um, you'd normally go to see your GP who will then refer you on to a uh, breast unit or breast service in one of the hospitals and it is likely that you will attend a once a breast clinic. Um, where I work, uh, we have really quite busy one-stop breast clinics, but because of what's happening at the moment, um, because of lockdown and also because of physical distancing, that's number one, but secondly, also because the you know services of the hospitals are currently being reconfigured to accommodate the acute services or the need for acute services, we are having to reduce the numbers of patients we see. Interestingly, although despite we, despite the fact that we have more or less halved the number of patients that we see, it is taking as long, if not perhaps longer, uh, to do the clinics. And that's because we are spacing the appointment times to minimize uh, the number of people waiting in the waiting rooms and also in between people that we see, we have to change our PPEs. So we're seeing patients with masks and eye protection and aprons and gloves. So throughout the clinic, we keep our masks on and our eye protection on. But in between our patients, we are changing our gloves and our aprons and of course, uh, washing our hands as well. And all of that takes time to do. I've just arrived in my clinic. I'm just going to do some preparation and um, I'll catch up with you in a bit. Somebody who fell ill during this pandemic was Mary Huckle. She had symptoms that sounded very much like COVID-19 symptoms, although she wasn't tested, so she couldn't be 100% sure. Nevertheless, this recent times were pretty stressful for Mary, not only because she was very unwell, but also because she is currently living with secondary stage four metastatic breast cancer. In episode 18, Mary told me about the results of her most recent scan and how the lockdown affected her treatment. Yeah. So now we're sort of like, we're just about to, yeah, because I had my PET scan in January, which showed me stable at that time. So we had, a, I had a little bit of like, you know, great, some stability. Mm -hmm. You know, capes working a little bit, nothing really too, you know, major, but it, you know, it was working. Um, but then COVID came along. And so then I had to come off treatment. And my latest PET scan, which was last Tuesday, showed pro further progression. Mm. So I've, it's now, in my ribs, my pelvis, and um, my spine, there are, are quite a few, but it's quite widespread. Gosh, so I'm so sorry, Mary. Cervical, thoraco, lumbar, spine, okay. which you know means up and down my spine, basically. Um, so it's really quite, I don't know how in bad it is in my spine but the liver has also got more progression and that's quite intense in my liver 
So, and also in the time that I've been off treatment and I have been feeling a few twinges here and there, because it's funny because sometimes cancer pain comes and goes, doesn't it? Yes. And I didn't know that, but then I kept thinking, well, it's okay because whatever that pain was I was having, it's gone. But then it might come back, you know, a bit later. And where where were you getting these niggly pains? In the niggly, the waves of pain. I had one weekend, a couple of weekends ago, where I get I got like waves of like in my right hand side, okay, which made me think, is that my liver, you know, or is it stress or is it anxiety? And also, what I have to deal with is because of my work, I do get pains and aches and pains, yeah, you know, from different exercises, or I get I might get DOMS, you know, delayed onset of muscle soreness or. So I do, so I have to try and somehow decipher what's, what's what. Do I tell my oncologist about this pain? Do I wait? You know, would it go? So anyway, so, but anyway, so there is progression. I've had that, I had that news last week and it worries me. What worries me now is how it's going to affect my work. Yeah. And can I still do high impact exercise or am I at risk? of fractures and things like that so um so it's in my ribs as well it was in my ribs before but it's progressed so yeah it's all it's widespread it's low volume widespread in most areas but the liver i think is the main concern although my liver function is still good okay well that's that's encouraging isn't it that's encouraging so that's that's good um so that uh, you've had to you've had a change of treatment then i'm i'm assuming so now so yesterday i had my first dose of erubulin um intravenous erubulin okay so they've so stopped cape cytobin cape cytobin stopped and thank goodness i didn't have to have a washout period yeah you know we've got the drugs approved straight away and i started it yesterday so i had my pet scan last tuesday got the results no i had it last wednesday sorry my pet scan got my results the following day on the thursday had my blood test on monday just gone and started my chemotherapy yesterday um so it's all gone you know thank goodness because i thought if he tells me that i've got to have a month of washing out that is going to take my anxiety to another level yeah um so i just thank goodness he was like you know we can get you on it straight away that's really good so um how often are you going to get this and for how long do you know so yeah so well for as long as it works i think because this is the thing now every treatment i've had i've never had an end date it's always been you're on it for as long as it works so that's 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 the way the cookie crumbles now yeah (laughs) you know I'm on treatment for life and it's just a case of and that's why I just want stability I want a reprieve I've had a year and a half of progression and I need some sort of like I need something to hold on to and I just keep hoping and praying that you know the next treatment is the right one and and the thought of exhausting my options is really scary. Yes. Because the longer I'm living, the scarier it gets. I'm already beating the odds. You know, the, the, the median is two to three years after a secondary diagnosis, or it could be two to five now, I'm not sure. But I'm beyond that. Uh, it will be six years for me in August. So, yeah. Now's direction is a professor of experimental psychopathology at Birkbeck University of London. And her work involves looking at the cognition and emotional interactions in emotional disorders such as anxiety and depression. We had a fascinating conversation in episode 16 about her work, which amongst many areas is looking at emotional vulnerability in those affected by breast cancer. In this clip, I asked her the possible reasons behind why there is a spectrum of ways in which people cope 
with a breast cancer diagnosis. And I really love your word of spectrum because we are on a spectrum of, you know, kind of normality of whatever normality is to kind of, you know, the, the other side. I don't want to use the word abnormal because I don't like it. Um, but we are on this spectrum. So I think um, what I'd like to do is kind of like categorize the answers into, t- into two different streams. So one stream is so if you, if you think about the different, you know, diagnoses that we get, you know, some have, you know, quite advanced cancers. And so the apprehension for them is, is greater and they may feel it much harder to deal with the, the implications of having those advanced cancers if they have young families or, and so forth. So they might, you know, experience greater emotional vulnerability. I'm not saying that a breast cancer diagnosis, you know, has differential impacts on people. No, but, you know, uh, for, for the majority, you know, we, we, we've got this tiny, you know, so we've got that extreme advance, but then we've got spectrum, a broad, broader spe- spectrum. And as you said, you know, some people find it, yes, yeah, yeah, I've, I've accepted to this, I'm, you know, to take more of a um, instrumental co- constructive approach, you know, in a problem solving approach. And they kind of say, well, yeah, I'm going to do this, this, this and this. And I'm quite happy in this space, yeah. whereas others um, can't. So one major um, factor that can be contributing to this is, um, you know, the different coping styles that we have adopted throughout life and the different experiences that we have had as children, as, you know, as as adults, um, the brain has learned to become comfortable with different habits that, you know, it's exercised. So if someone, you know, classes herself as a worrier or an anxious person, then um, the her or his brain um, has a greater susceptibility to become anxious, more anxious and more distressed right. um, in stressful situations. So there is this kind of, if you'd like to say, the state that you're in and then the traits that you have. So there's an interaction between the two. If you are already classed as a, someone vulnerable um, due to the past history that you've had and you have been under chronic stress, you've suffered depression, you've been, you know, um, uh, through various kinds of situations that have made you suffer abuse, then, um, you know, your brain has become more in tuned with responding anxiously because right. quite rightly so you are vigilant for signs of danger what if i'm attacked again or what if i become threatened again There's how am i mechanism. going to respond yes exactly so you have more of that type of coping which is you know which which the brain really has become tuned into because of your vulnerability and that's what we call trait vulnerability. I mean, if it, I always remember this example, uh, a colleague of mine once said that, you know, she, she grew up in a war zone and she had, but, but when the war ended, they had guests over and, um, that, you know, with, with her friends, she was walking down this road and suddenly some kind of a, you know, tire exploded, uh, maybe close by, but it, sounded like you know a a bomb was being exploded suddenly some of the girls kind of you know went down on the ground because they thought well actually there's another shell shock coming along but the others who hadn't experienced those war war time war zone experiences were thinking well why are they on the floor this was just kind of you know uh, a a car you know or some something just fell from somewhere why are they so scared so it's the same stimulus but different reactions one of the reasons why i created this podcast is to open up conversations about breast cancer so that we can learn from each other we can share experiences and stories Helena Trail, as part of a graduate project, decided to create a book that collated a hundred stories from people affected by various cancers. Her main aim was to open up conversations surrounding cancer so that it becomes part of normal conversation and not a taboo subject. In episode eight, Helena describes the importance of social media in bringing together these difficult conversations. 
And I also think I, your question at the beginning about this generational divide, um, I think there was something quite interesting, not necessarily generation, but this idea of open conversation and who is advocates of this open conversation, that the women that have had breast cancer and have become part of these groups like Breast Cancer Now or they're on Twitter, they're all very um, good at being vocal or the one, the people I met anyway, they really wanted to help and write their story and write it down. And I found a lot of them had blogs and I just, yeah, I found that idea quite interesting that that group of women that came forward from Liz were really willing to share and help me because loads of them didn't even know who I was. <laughs> A lot of people had a lot of trust in me. <laughs> I mean, do you think people who have been affected by breast cancer are, are more willing to talk about it more openly? I think it depends if they have been part of those groups. So, for example, uh, I had my launch party at Maggie's, which is another, another charity that um, I've have helped me, and I can explain about them a bit later. But they, um, we had that on Tuesday this week, and my grandma came, and she doesn't like whether that's generational she doesn't like talking about her illness and she that she went through radiotherapy and multiple breast surgeries this summer she said oh I didn't know about all these um all these groups and about breast cancer now and all that kind of thing she had no idea she has a quite what I think is interesting is she has a really good regime kind of since so she has horses and her um she goes and visits her husband at a nursing home every day i was talking about it with her yesterday that she's come out of um of her treatment and she's go, gone back into her kind of timetable of doing these things every day so she's actually been fine the aftermath of after coming out of treatment whereas there's a lot of in the book there's a lot of speak of people who have gone through this treatment and they come out the other end and don't really know what to do Yes. Um, and so they've gone on the internet and they found these friends and they've had these discussions. And that was a bit of a random thought process. Sorry. <laughs> but that kind of brings back to the importance of being able to talk about cancer openly because, you know, it doesn't actually even need to be a generational thing. But if you are perhaps not connected to others via social media, then, you know, you may not have the outlet to talk about it with other people. Yeah. And that's where social media is so powerful and so valid and useful in situations like this. So there you have it, a getting together of all of the guests who have appeared on the podcast so far. I have enjoyed every single one of these conversations and I hope you have too. If you have missed any of these episodes, then you can find them all um, on the My Breast, My Health podcasting page um, on whichever app you are listening to. So you can catch up on all those that you have missed or re-listen to your favorite episodes. So I'm going to take a little break over the summer, but we'll be back towards the end of the summer with more exciting guests. Please do connect with me on Twitter and Instagram at Dr. Tasha G. So that's D-R Tasha G. And let me know if you would like to be on the show or if you have someone in mind you think I should definitely get onto the show. As always, I will leave all the links of all these episodes in the show notes at mybreastmyhealth.com forward slash episode 20. If you haven't done so already, I would urge you to hit that subscribe button. So when I return, you will be notified straight away and so you won't miss any of the new upcoming episodes. And I have to say, I am super excited about our upcoming guests. So I definitely would subscribe so you don't miss out.